Welcome to my presentation on imaging of the hip. What I would like to do in the next 20 minutes or so is go over some very basic imaging of the hip, uh, focus on radiography. We'll talk about anatomy, describe some of the common radiographic pro projections, then we'll look at some cases and we'll use uh, OSIRIX to go through some basic MRI review points. The hip is obviously part of the pelvis, and I'll show a little bit of pelvic anatomy as well, but focus in on the hip joint itself. Anatomically, we know that the hip bone, or innominate bone, is made up of three different bones, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And the acetabular socket is the hip joint itself that articulates with the femur shown here, both in anterior and posterior images from a cadaver showing the different anatomic parts of the femur that we'll look at in more detail in a minute. It's important to know that the acetabulum is not a complete hemisphere in terms of the articular surface itself, but rather it's a C-shaped structure as shown on this image. If you look at a cadaveric image, you can see that the articular cartilage is this substance here that again is not complete. It's, it's not present centrally in the place called the acetabular Fossa. And that becomes very important on imaging both radiography and MRI because we don't expect to see cartilage where it's not normally supposed to be. I've taken a number of images from this beautiful book by Greenspan and uh, given them credit here below to uh, indicate that it's a nice, nice reference for looking for these different types of projections. So the typical AP pelvis view, anterior posterior view of the pelvis or hip coned in is shown here where they have the x-ray beam and the patient position. It's sort of self-explanatory leading to the AP pelvis. So creating an image like this. <clears throat> it's fairly common actually to do a so-called low AP pelvis where we clip off the iliac crest because the idea is that that's not necessarily important for that clinical indication of the hips, but we want to center up on imaging of the hips. And it's important when we talk about femoral acetabular impingement that the projection be centered in the midline rather than centered over the hip. Another important positioning thing is that naturally when we lay down our feet tend to rotate externally like shown in this, this picture and what that does to the radiographs is it makes the femoral neck look foreshortened so that can create a, an image that's difficult to interpret and could be could actually be misinterpreted so both for radiography and when we do hip injections, we have the feet turned either neutral or slightly internal rotation, and that tends to lay out the femoral necks like this. Um, in orthopedic trauma, for pelvic trauma in particular, and some other uh, applications, they do other specialized views. So here is showing the so-called pelvic outlet view, where the beam is looking kind of at the, the outlet of the pelvis, the undersurface of the symphysis here. Um, you can also do the opposite, which is an inlet view, shooting down to see kind of what you think of as the inlet of the pelvis for a fetus um, coming into the pelvis and, and then eventually out, out exiting here in the outlet <clears throat> type view. These types of views are used by orthopedic trauma surgeons to look at overall pelvic alignment, particularly in the case of pelvic fracture or acetabular fractures. Another specialized view that's done for the pelvis or for hips is the obturator uh, oblique view called the Jude view, and that's a 45 degree oblique view, in this case showing the full pelvis. You can do it just on one side as well, um, showing the different columns of the acetabulum. So there's a, a right side down and a left side down view. And so on these types of views, on this patient on the right side, you can see the posterior column of the acetabulum here. And on the contralateral side, you see the anterior column of the acetabulum here. A little bit of a steeper view is called the false profile view. It's about 65 degrees. This is used more commonly for things like developmental dysplasia of the hip. And it's uh, useful to look at these views for the depth of the acetabulum, the uh, socket, to see if there's good femoral head coverage. It's also a good way to look at narrowing in different parts of the hip joint that are not necessarily visible on the other views. So back to the standard AP view of the hip, the key structures that we want to identify on that view are shown in this cartoon here where you have femoral head, greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, and of course the same anatomy on the radiographs. You have the femoral head neck junction. Here you can see the physeal scar. And so the hip joint space is shown as this lucency here between the femoral head 
and the roof of the acetabulum. This sclerotic line right here is called the sorsal, and that is an area of normal sclerosis because of the weight-bearing surface of the hip. Um, that's important not to over it, over interpret that sclerosis. You can see centrally you have the acetabular fossa, and remember it as I said in the beginning, there's actually no cartilage in there. It's filled with fat and a ligament that we'll look at in a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other lines that you want to look at on the hip radiograph, probably the more important ones include the posterior acetabular wall here. It's a difficult structure to see because it's very faint sometimes. And here's the anterior acetabular wall here, crossing over the posterior wall just a tiny bit in this patient. So here's the walls on the AP view, anterior wall, posterior wall. The A and the B lines here are indicating the, the so-called uh, iliopectineal line or iliopubic line here of the pelvis, and this line along here is the ilioischial line, okay? And those are lines that are important to look at in terms of acetabular fractures and other disorders. Um, in addition to the AP view, you could get a frog leg lateral view, and you can see why it's called a frog leg view, because this person's looking like a frog here laying down. Um, the, the pelvis may be rotated a little bit, but the key thing is that the, uh, the legs are played out like a, like a frog here. And so that gives a different rotation, a different projection of the femoral head and neck. Another view that's really important to know about is the true lateral view. And this is a situation where the patient cannot put the leg into a frog leg position, typically because they have a fracture or suspected fracture or that they have a recent prosthesis placed and they don't want to stress the hip in, a, in an atypical position at, for fear of dislocating the prosthesis. So, Here's a, a subject showing what a frog, uh, sorry, a true lateral view would look like. Back in the old days, we had film, uh, hard copy film here that would be exposed. Now it's a digital cassette, obviously, but a little bit of an oblique projection. The opposite leg is elevated up. Presumably, that's a healthy leg, but the affected leg of interest is laying straight supine like this one. And so you get a view that looks like this, where this would be cephalad and caudad, and you have the femoral head here, acetabulum, and the femoral neck and the trochanter seen here. And this is a very important view to get a good radiographic exposure on and to be good at looking at because it's your friend in terms of detecting fractures um, in the acute setting. So standard views of the hip could include an AP view like this one, frog leg lateral view and cross table lateral view. And we let our, our orthopedic surgeons and other referring physicians determine what, what views they like for their practice. But it's not uncommon for a three-view hip to look like something like this. So what I'll do now is go through some case examples, and I'm not going to go through an exhaustive uh, list of every possible disorder of the hip, but I want to focus on some of the basic radiographic principles. So here's an example of a 52-year-old man who has pain after crashing his bicycle. And you can see, I think, pretty easily that here's the femoral head, here's the femoral neck. There's a lucency along the medial femoral neck here, so that is a fracture. Notice more laterally there's sclerosis, and that's also part of the fracture, but here's where the bone is impacted and it's overlapping, so you're getting increased density there. So this is a fracture across the mid-femoral neck. On the true lateral view, you can see the femoral head, anterior part of the femoral neck here, posterior part. The fracture is a little bit difficult to see, but it's cutting right across the femoral neck here. So you really want to scrutinize this true lateral view in all cases for little deviations or lucencies because these fractures can be very subtle on the other views. The trabecular pattern in the proximal femur is really important to be aware of and it's helpful in fracture detection because when we have a good normal we expect to see these nice trabeculae coming down for this principal compressive group shown here. You have a secondary compressive group that comes across like this and then you have a tensile group that goes kind of curvilinear like this. So they, they become more or, or less apparent in patients with osteoporosis, these trabeculae, <clears throat> but they are helpful in terms of looking at the normal expected pattern of trabeculae and continuity for fracture detection. So here's a normal in that patient who had the bike crash. You can see the, the compressive trabeculae here and the tensile trabeculae somewhat along here um, coming along, but you see that those are interrupted in the case of the fracture on the right side, okay? So that's a pretty easy fracture to detect. Femoral fractures are described in terms of their location. So you may think of something in a subcapital just below the head location or a, a basicervical or transcervical across the neck. 
They could be intertrochanteric or they could be subtrochanteric. In location, these latter two are outside the hip capsule and the first two are inside the hip capsule. You can also have isolated fractures that involve like the greater trochanter or potentially the lesser trochanter of the femur. Here's another case of an older woman, 69 year old, after a fall. Take a look at this for a second and see if you can see an asymmetry that might be a fracture. We'll focus in on the right hip here. You see this band of sclerosis here that's not present on the opposite side. So here's that band of sclerosis. And another feature to look for when you're having a possible fracture is, is discontinuity of the femoral neck. So on this frog leg lateral view, which they were able to do on this patient, you can see the femoral neck and then it bumps out here. There's an acute angulation where the fracture is. On the posterior part, it's not so obvious. On a true lateral view, you can see there's a little bit of an offset of the femoral head with the neck here. And so the fracture is coming across like so. Here's a different patient another older woman after a fall, hip pain, unable to bear weight, high suspicion for fracture, very difficult to detect a fracture here. You can see the trabeculae running along the femoral neck. You can follow the contours of the femoral head neck junction on the true lateral view nicely here. There's no obvious cortical break. There's no obvious lucency. There's none of that overlap that we see. One of my colleagues actually thought that maybe the trabecular pattern was a little bit smudgy in this patient, a little bit indistinct, uh, pretty difficult call. So in this setting, it's not uncommon to do either CT scan or MR imaging to try to detect a radiographically occult or very subtle fracture. <clears throat> and in this patient, MRI of that right hip showed this irregular line in the intertrochanteric region on this proton density weighted image. And you can see on the T2 fat set image, irregular line with surrounding edema, some soft tissue injury here, or at least edema going along with an intertrochanteric fracture. So obviously this is an important thing to detect because that'll help determine patient management. Take a look at this case. So this patient has had a hip replacement on the right side. We're gonna forget about that for now. What about the left hip? So in this example, the left hip shows a little bit of an angular abnormality of the femoral head neck junction. That looks to me like it's suspicious for a fracture. So you'd really wanna scrutinize the, uh, the other images as well. There's a little subtle lucency across the greater trochanter that I'll point out right here. That's also suspicious for a fracture. But we don't know really whether this one is true or not or if it's old or not. Now, this is a good role for MR imaging as well because what it shows us on this T1-weighted image is this low signal line in the intertrochanteric region corresponding edema on T2. But the femoral head neck junction is actually normal. So that subcapital region fracture is indeed an old fracture this is the acute fracture here, and the treatment for those will be different in terms of the hardware that's placed, so that's important. And another thing to always keep in mind in your early training, and hopefully forever, is that you always look for old films, and in fact, this patient had images a year before that showed that that was indeed an old fracture in the subcapital region a year before. Take a look at this case for a second. Um, younger patient, hockey injury, femoral head neck junction looks good. Um, trabeculae look good involving the femoral neck, trochanter looks pretty good, don't really see anything definitely abnormal on the true lateral view here. So he had continued pain and it was suspected that he had a fracture so he went to MR imaging and so here you can see abnormal signal in the greater trochanter and you can see a subtle line across the trochanter on this view with edema on both sides. Some edema does extend kind of down the femoral uh, intertrochanteric region, but it didn't traverse the shaft. So this was treated as a isolated greater trochanter fracture. Um, and I'll show the follow-up images in a second. One thing I want to point out here is in, in our routine hip protocol, uh, just for pain assessment, we often do coronal proton density images without fat suppression to look at the cartilage and the joint. And that's actually not a very good sequence to look for fractures. It's very hard to see that fracture on this image, much easier to see on the previous T1-weighted image here. The fat-suppressed T2-weighted weighted images are quite good. So he was treated non-operatively. Here's the images on the day of the injury. Here's the follow-up. You can see a lucency and a little bit of sclerosis in that fracture, but no femoral neck fracture. <clears throat> Another thing that can happen is osseous stress injury, and this is the setting of more, more chronic, uh, repetitive injury. And here's an athlete with a, a low signal fracture line in the mid femoral neck surrounded by a lot of low signal on T1, a lot of high signal on T2, and that's a pretty common type of femoral neck fracture. 
stress fracture, partial fracture in the setting of, of athletes, and they're, they're typically incomplete and on this compressive side over here. On radiography, they may be completely occult at symptom onset, so completely normal looking radiograph. On follow-up, you may see sclerosis along the fracture line. You may see subtle callus formation as well along the fracture line here. Those injuries are fairly common. They're important to detect because they can be a, a problem if the patient goes on to complete the fracture, um, leading to complications. So most commonly on the compressive side, occasionally on the tensile side, laterally, um, they can be lowered down by the iliopsoas. You can also get stress injuries of the femoral diaphysis, which is not going to be covered in this talk, and then things about the knee. Let's move on to another topic here and uh, take a look at this woman, 49-year-old woman that came in with left hip pain. If you look at that image for a second. <clears throat> there was no history of trauma. She just had about one day of pain after um, some exercise, but not, nothing traumatic. So an MRI was done in this patient. It shows a large effusion in the left hip joint. All this white is fluid, some surrounding edema here in the soft tissues. And so the considerations for this would be um, somewhat broad, but could include an inflammatory disorder. Um, it could include um, possibly injury, though that amount of diffusion with injury would be uncommon. The key thing to recognize in this scenario is that uh, of the onset of an possible hip joint infection or a septic joint. And so the key thing to remember here is not to miss a hip joint infection. And so this patient had a low-grade fever, a little bit of an elevated white count, and so had other indications for possible infection. We aspirated the hip joint. A little bit of contrast was injected just to confirm intraarticular positioning. And this turned out to be a streptococcal septic joint uh, in this younger, youngish woman um, who, in fact, had, had had a recent urinary tract infection, which may have been the source of seeding the hip. Especially in native hips, it's very important not to miss a infected joint. You can see the sequelae in this patient that had extensive osteolysis about the hip, the femoral head and acetabulum after not recognizing a hip joint infection going on to basically destroy the joint very quickly. Yet another different topic here. Here's a 22-year-old man with just gradual onset of right hip pain. And you may notice here that there's increased density sclerosis in the femoral head here. And you can see it on this frog leg lateral view as well. The joint space looks normal. Contours of the femoral head look pretty normal. <clears throat> so this is actually avascular necrosis in a patient with sickle cell anemia in that case. And just keep in mind that this is staged according to the FICAT classification system, stages one through four. Uh, I won't go into details on that, but like many things in orthopedics, there's a classification system. Here's some examples from my files of stage one being basically completely normal radiographs. It may be abnormal on MRI at that time. Stage two is sclerosis, but maintained contour. Stage three is where you start to get flattening of the femoral head. And then stage four is further flattening, and typically with joint space loss as well, and a pretty bad uh, arthritic hip at that point. MRI is much more sensitive than radiographs, and so that's the, the key test to do if there's a suspicion of AVN, but with normal radiographs. I would say the most common indications or risk factors for AVN are um, hematologic disorders, and especially prior use of corticosteroids in patients that have had previous leukemia or lymphoma or other disorders that are treated with steroids. Here's a patient that had leukemia, and she has a subchondral fracture, this curvilinear lucency, um, hyperintensity in the femoral head here, going uh, all the way around the contour of the femoral head. That's about ready to collapse. Moving on to another disorder yet, um, here's a 20-year-old man who had right hip pain, no particular trauma, though he was an athlete. Um, and take a look at the femoral head neck junctions in this patient for a second. So hopefully you can notice that the joint space is pretty normal. We can look at the acetabular contours a little bit, but there's a very prominent bump on the femoral head neck junction here. <clears throat> and so over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been recognition of different morphologic variations in hip anatomy that we are born with and that are probably normal in many situations, but they can be abnormal as well. And so I won't go into detail here, but just to show you that you can have normal contours of the femoral head and acetabulum. You can have a deep socket in so-called coxa profunda where this floor of the acetabular fossa goes 
medial to the ilioischial line. You can also have so-called cam deformity of the femoral head neck junction here where you have a, a bump that looks kind of like a gun handle that's prominent. And the idea is that either if you have a deep socket or if you have bump on the femur, when you flex and adduct the hip and flex it, it tends to put the patient at risk for impingement of the femur on the acetabulum, so femoral acetabular impingement. The other thing we look at is offset of the femoral head and neck. Here, so here's the femoral head is centered on the femoral neck. Here there's a little bit less offset, there's a little bit of anterior prominence, and here's a very focal bony prominence of the anterior femoral head neck junction in this patient here who has a large cam deformity. I just want to point out this article because of the one article that I think you should read about FAI for radiography, it's this one by Tanist in 2007, and they do a beautiful job of describing the different disorders and the different um, subtypes of disorder and mixed disorders, um, great illustrations of the so-called pincer type of acetabular overcoverage and the CAM type of impingement, and then they go through the radiographic findings. So I won't go through those here, I actually have those in another video that I have online. Um, but it's important to look at those lines and describe them depending on your referring surgeon. Here's an example of that TAM morphology where we look at something called the alpha angle, which is the angle that's prescribed where this goes outside the circle prescribing the femoral neck um, here. And you can see on this example where there's more bone here, this line exits the circle here earlier on. So this is a higher so-called alpha angle that correlates with CAM type femoral acetabular impingement. Now we do a lot of MR imaging for this, especially MR arthrography, and this is an example of injection in the hip joint of gadolinium. There's that cam deformity. Here's the T1 fat set oblique image, and here's the coronal T1 fat set image showing a pair of the acetabular labrum here superiorly, and that cam deformity of the femoral head. So FAI is a very popular diagnosis these days. We, for many years, have looked at these cystic changes along the femoral head neck junction and didn't know what those were, but they're probably related to FAI. Now, the last couple of minutes, I just want to show a quick spin through a couple of MR imaging um, studies to show you how I do this, and I'll go through a more systematic review of it um, <clears throat> on a different presentation. But basically, when I look at hip MRI, I look at a combination of T1-weighted images and coronal T proton density or T2-weighted images looking for these features, the bony structures, joint effusion, labrum, cartilage, and ligamentum teres. And so if I switch over to Osirix here for a second, <clears throat> this is a relatively normal hip in a young woman. She has a little bit of a joint effusion here, but look at the bony contours, look for things like osteophytes, look for bone marrow edema. Here's the acetabular labrum shown here. And the articular cartilage of the hip is very, very thin so you need to be very careful when you're looking for that, but on in the sequences you can scroll back and forth and you can see this thin gray layer of cartilage along the femoral surface and acetabular surface. And basically when you're looking for labral tears, you're looking for abnormal signal within the acetabular labrum. Since we're running out of time, I'm not going to go into much greater detail on this, but <clears throat> we go through the coronals, then I'll go through the sagittal images looking for the same type of anatomy. I'm looking for the, um, the articular cartilage along the femur here, looking for the, acet the acetabular labrum superiorly right in here. Difficult to see when it's small and normal. <clears throat> and then I'll go through the axial images looking at the um, bony anatomy, and this is the best imaging plane for looking at all the different tendinous structures. So you have like iliopsoas, you have the gluteal tendons, the rectus, and posteriorly, this patient had some hamstring partial tearing. You can see bone edema in the ischial tuberosity and partial tearing of the proximal hamstring tendons. Now, we also do MR arthrography in many patients, and this is just a quick example of a coronal T1-weighted fat-suppressed image showing the acetabular labrum here, and a T2 fat-suppressed image showing the labrum here. And then I'll show one last example of an abnormal labrum here, <clears throat> different patient, coronal T1 fat sat, T2 fat-suppressed image. See the increased signal within the labrum here. 
along the this, this superior part of the labrum. And if I scroll along, you can see it goes pretty extensively throughout the posterior labrum and then along anteriorly as well. And we'll see that better on a sagittal image here. So here's anterior here. And here's the acetabular labrum with increased in intrasubstance signal within it, a large cyst forming within the labrum. So cystic change and degeneration in a setting of a labral tear. In this patient, the articular cartilage is actually pretty much intact. You see the thin layers of cartilage right there. So that's a really quick tour of some of the um, MR imaging anatomy. I go through the, I tend to go through the coronals, then I go through the sagittals, and then I go through the axials for these different things here and kind of have a systematic checklist of things to look at. There's some other resources to point out. You always want to have an anatomy atlas available when you're looking and learning. Um, so X-ray head is one. There's e-anatomy and many others. Um, we have other cases available online on the Clarapax website that we have at Stanford. And then I have a YouTube channel as well. So that's a quick tour of the hip. Um, I hope you've gotten something useful out of it and you'll uh, make good diagnoses. So thank you so much for your attention.